My name is Damien Bailey and I'm Professor of Physiology and Biochemistry and Director of the Research Institute of Health and Wellbeing at the University of South Wales. On July the 8th, 2015, during its annual meeting in Cardiff, the Physiological Society generously supported a symposium entitled The Brain in Hypoxia, Curiosity, Cause and Consequence. Five international speakers were invited to discuss how the brain copes, or indeed fails to cope, with environmental hypoxia, and to outline the defence mechanisms that collectively serve to defend oxygenation. The symposium started with a presentation of how our human brain has evolved to be so incredibly oxygen-dependent. Unable to compromise on such an excessive energy budget in the face of meagre oxygen reserves, however, renders it especially vulnerable to failure unable to sustain metabolism for more than a second if blood supply were to be interrupted by anoxia. This can result in devastating consequences as the complications associated with stroke and head trauma stand clinical testament too. Given that its oxygen supply is so delicate, it would seem intuitive for evolution to have favoured feedback mechanisms capable of sensing subtle changes in blood oxygen concentration and transmitting signals to the cerebral vasculature coupling local cerebral oxygen delivery to tissue metabolic de demand. This was the focus of the first presentation via Professor Philip Ainsley, who addressed the fundamental mechanisms underlying the defense of cerebral oxygenation during hypoxia, with a focus on molecular oxygen sensing pathways that contribute towards the coupling of oxygen delivery to tissue metabolic demand. He summarised over 50 years' worth of data, highlighting the compensatory increases in global seroperfusion, such that oxygen delivery remains well-preserved even in response to physiological extremes of arterial hypoxemia. He highlights a key role for the red blood cell, with the allosteric transition of haemoglobin from the relaxed to the tense state, implicated as the primary mechanism underpinning cerebral vasodilatation, unified through activation of the nitric oxide pathway. The second speaker, Professor Chris Imray, extends these findings to suggest that technical limitations have likely led to an underestimation of the cerebral vasodilatory response to hypoxia, and to what extent cerebral hyperperfusion can be seen to be maladaptive, predisposing to the neurological syndromes encountered at high altitude known as acute mountain sickness and the more malignant form of high altitude cerebral edema. The third speaker, Dr. Peter Rasmussen, reviews whether exercise starts and ends in the brain as opposed to muscle, known as the central versus peripheral fatigue argument. While systemic hypoxia has been shown to promote central fatigue through activation of group 3 and group 4 muscle afferents and corresponding reduction in neural drive, to what extent this can be attributed to cerebral hypoxia per se remains controversial, due in part to the experimental challenges associated with disassociating brain from muscle oxygenation. Invasive approaches that have mathematically derived cerebral mitochondrial partial pressures of oxygen suggest that while not a limiting factor in normoxia, cerebral deoxygenation can accelerate central fatigue and contributes towards impaired submaximal exercise performance during severe hypoxia. The fourth speaker, Dr. Sam Lucas provides clinical insight into the neuroprotective benefits conferred by long-term exercise training and the associated molecular, metabolic, hemodynamic and structural functional adaptations that have the potential to prevent cognitive decline, neurodegenerative diseases and stroke. He emphasizes the need to understand the basics to provide an evidence base for the prescription and future optimization of novel exercise interventions that selectively target the human brain. Finally, the fifth speaker, Dr. Sarah Milton, shifts the focus from the physiological inadequacies of the mammalian brain to one of nature's extreme performers, the anoxia-tolerant freshwater turtle whose brain has learned to negotiate severe oxygen deprivation and reoxygenation by taking advantage of a coordinated defense and rescue strategy honed over millions of years of evolution. These remarkable vertebrates survive by consciously entering into a reversible coma, a state of metabolic suppression that effectively shuts down eye influx and neurotransmitter release. Dr. Milton describes the molecular mechanisms involved in shifting the balance away from oxidative stress and apoptosis to collectively promote neuronal survival, highlighting the differential regulation of AKT, 
ERK1 and 2 heat shock proteins and antioxidant pathways. Simply put, no oxygen, no problem. The five speakers have emphasized that arterial hypoxemia is indeed a hallmark feature of diseases that affect the cerebral circulation, yet our understanding of how hypoxia impacts the human brain continues to remain unclear. The timely reviews provided by contributors to the symposium provide important insight into how the brain has evolved to cope with the challenges and identifies those physiological features that establish limits across the spectrum of hypoxia tolerant species. It is hoped that the knowledge gained will help shine light on alternative neuroprotective pathways that could serve as therapeutic targets for diseases characterized by oxygen deprivation. Getting more of the molecule that made the world to the organ that makes us remains the holy grail for scientists, clinicians and performers alike. These reviews will be published in Experimental Physiology and I hope that they will serve as a stimulus to encourage more discussion about this important topic. Thank you.